أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ربنا زدنا علما اللهم فقهنا في الدين إلهي أمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I welcome all of you to our Ramadan series 2024 and today we'll be covering just number 22 so inshallah let's begin just to give you a quick recap last time we concluded our session with surah sajida and subhanallah after a long list of makki surahs finally we have a madani surah which surah is this surah ahzab so this surah is uh basically it started from juice number 21 and we're gonna continue it in juice number 22 because um passage of surah the uh, ahzab has been divided in both these edges up so inshallah that's where we will commence our session for today so an overview for juice number 22 this juice is going to have the remaining portion of surat ahzab surat saba surat fatir and surat yasin and amongst these surahs, all the way from Saba till Yasin, they are all Makki surahs, whereas Surat Ahzab is Madani surah. So, with this brief intro, let's begin. Audhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ayah number one: Ya ayyuha nabi ittaqillah wa la tuti al kafirin wa al munafiqin. Inna Allah kana aliman hakima. O Prophet, revere God. Fear Allah and do not obey the unbelievers and the hypocrites. Verily, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all-knowing and all-wise. So when we look at Surah Ahzab, it discusses three important events that are going to be highlighted in this surah. First off is the Battle of Ahzab, also known as the Battle of Khandaq or the Battle of Trench. What does Ahzab literally mean? The confederates or the clans. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will present to us the scene of the battle of trench when all these confederates, all these clans came to attack the Muslims in Medina. So scenes are going to be sketched out for us in the surah. Also in the surah, we are going to be told about the raid on Banu Quraida that was in the month of Dhul Qaeda in the fifth year of Hijrah. And also, uh, this surah is going to highlight to us Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's marriage with Zainab bint Jahash. And subhanAllah, this passage um, addresses the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa directly. Because as you can see, this surah starts off by addressing Ayyuhan Nabi. Ya Ayyuhan Nabi. So this surah has multiple ayat addressing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam directly because we're going to see this repetition of Ya Ayyuhan Nabi and because this is a Madani Surah important commands will be established in this Surah as well so let's begin ayah number two mentions to us about the prohibition of zihar what is zihar zihar was basically a practice that was prevalent in pre-Islamic Arabia when a man would have an argument with his wife he would simply pronounce a statement similar to divorce in order to oppress the wife. So he would say, you are like the back of my mother. And this meant that I am not going to have any uh, marital relationship with you. I'm not going to give you any marital rights, nor will I divorce you so that you have the freedom to marry someone else. So this was basically a mode of tyranny on women such that the wife is basically left in a state of limbo and she's not able to do anything. She's not able to separate. She's not able to live happily. So Islam came to abolish this uh, practice of vihar. So this is what is being highlighted over here. Another command that we find in this passage is the prohibition of giving our surname to our adopted children. Why is that so? Is this a biased decision? Of course not. A child should be known by his real biological father. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us. And what's the wisdom behind it? Because it is to protect the lineage of the child and avoid legal complications in future regarding rights of inheritance. So basically, it clarifies the concept that an adopted sibling is not like a real biological sibling. 
So subhanAllah, it's going to make um, matters easy for all of us in future in terms of the rights of inheritance. Plus, because of the fact that an adopted sibling is not like a real biological sibling, marriage is possible between your real child and the adopted child. So the criteria of haya, modesty, will have to be maintained. And if we can follow the simple guideline of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we can make things easy for ourselves. Next, we go on to ayah number six. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is more caring towards the believers than themselves. And his wives are in the position of their mothers. So the question is, do we even know who our mothers are? And by mothers, these are the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who are given the title of Ummahatul Mu'mineen, mothers of the believers. So this is a list of all the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who got married to him. Now, why is it important for us to know this list? Because these are our mothers and subhanAllah, they have also set a legacy for us being a woman, whatever they have accomplished in terms of Islam, in terms of their character, that's something a must for all of us to learn as Muslim women. Now, when we look at this exhaustive list, at times we think to ourselves, how come the Prophet ﷺ got married to so many women? Or we think to ourselves, why polygamy as a whole is permissible in Islam where it's something that's not prevalent today? And it's true. There are very few countries that allow polygamy, for instance, Africa and some places in the Middle East. And according to the PEW research released in 2020, only about 2% of the global population lives in polygamous households. But the fact of the matter is that Islam didn't initiate polygamy. That's something important for us to know. SubhanAllah, this was something that existed from the early dawn of human history. Because if we look at the Old Testament, we come to know that several prominent prophets had multiple wives. For instance, Abraham, Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, Prophet Jacob, David, Suleiman alayhi salam, and others. They all had multiple wives. So this is something we come to know from biblical scriptures as well. If we look at Hinduism, Numerous Hindu texts denote that polygamy was a common practice among certain circles of the Indian elite until the 20th century, when the Parliament of India banned it for all Hindus. So our mind wanders again, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow a man to marry multiple wives? Now, if we look from a bird eye view, there are numerous explanations to this. For instance, in the olden days, it was nearly impossible for an unmarried woman to provide for herself. Women were often uneducated and untrained, so they basically relied on their fathers, brothers, and husbands for provision and protection in order to protect themselves from slavery. And back then, there used to be a lot of battles, a lot of wars. So a lot of soldiers would die, leaving the women behind, leaving the children behind. Now, who's going to take care of those women? Who's going to take care of all the orphans if one man only gets married to one woman? So Alhamdulillah, Allah allowed polygamy so that there's no woman left behind who is without a caretaker. Her husband is supposed to be a caretaker and companion for her at all times. Since there are cases when a woman doesn't have a father or a brother. If both of them die, then who's going to take care of her? So that's the reason why, subhanAllah, this is something which is permissible in Islam. Another important thing that we should know is that when something is permissible in Islam, it doesn't mean it's obligatory in Islam, okay? So there is a difference. Something which is allowed doesn't mean it's a must. And subhanAllah, when we look at Western cultures, almost all the Western cultures have forbidden polygamy. 
But unfortunately, adultery is rampant in all these countries. Despite all efforts to promote monogamous relationships, many men have mistresses, resulting in higher divorce rates, broken families, children being born out of wedlock, problems arising due to it. So Islam discourages premarital affairs and postmarital affairs and permits polygamy in order to protect the rights of women. For instance, if we look at the present population of America, statistics show that there are more women than men. If every adult American man marries only one woman, there would still be more than 25 million women in the United States who would not be able to get husbands, considering the fact that according to the latest statistics, 10% of the American population is gay. That's close to 30 million people. So in that case, what's the option for a woman who wants to get married? Options are either she marries a married man or she stays single or she pursues a haram relationship. And a haram relationship is not going to give her any rights. No rights from religion or the law of the land. So what's better? The permissibility of polygamy, right? So it is permissible in Islam, provided that the man is able to do justice between the wives, inshallah. So these are our mothers, mothers of believers. And when we look at the Prophet wasallam's life, he didn't get married to all these women because he wanted to. There were certain conditions. Some of them were commands from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of the marriages were done to take care of the orphans who were left behind. So there were different reasons involved. And every marriage had hikmah behind it, had benefits behind it. That is for us to learn, subhanAllah. And each one of the mothers have so many things for us, uh, subhanAllah, to learn so that we can apply it in our lives. So make sure that after this course, inshallah, we try to do a deep study of our mothers, Ummahat al Mu'minin, so that we can know them better and we can learn from them. So now a passage regarding the battle of Ahzab will be presented to us. And this surah is named after this battle. So before we proceed with its discussion, I just wanted to give you a glimpse of this battle. How was it like? So this was a battle when various tribes got together as an army of 10,000 strong in order to attack the Muslims. And the Muslims had never encountered such a huge opposition. So on the suggestion of one of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu by the name of Salman al-Farsi, the Muslims dug a trench around the city of Medina in order to protect themselves. So each person was required to guard the trench 24-7, while others were told to protect the women and children and take care of them. Now, if you look at the map, Medina is naturally covered with volcanic tracks. So the trench was only constructed on one side. Now the question may pop up in our minds that what was the reason behind constructing a trench? Couldn't the Muslims just fight like they did in Badr and Uhud? And the answer is no, they couldn't. Because this was the first time that the opposition army comprised of 10,000 people. And the Muslims were not as many. So the Muslims had to come up with a strategy as a mode of self-defense. Because they lacked in resources and number. So yes, the trench was created. However, what happened was that one of the Jewish tribes by the name of Banu Qurayla who had a peace treaty with the Muslims in Medina and they promised to protect the Muslims from within the city, they planned on treason. They conspired with the Munafiqeen, they conspired with the non-Muslims against the Muslims so that the non-Muslims can attack Medina from outside and 
the Jews attack the Muslims from within the city such that the Muslims die being crushed in between both of them. So what happened next? What was the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Let us see. So I number nine till 11. Now keeping this context in mind, let's, Let's read the ayat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya yuha ladina amanu, remember the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on you when forces came against you and we sent against them a wind and forces you couldn't see. Allah is observant of what you do. When they came at you from above and below and eyes were dazzled, Hearts reach the throats and you harbored doubts about Allah. The believers were tested and severely shaken. So you can analyze that this was an extremely tense situation for the Muslims. Imagine living in a war zone when you have the fear of being attacked from within your house plus outside as well. So it's truly traumatic. The people who actually witness these disturbing situations, that's how they suffer from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. This is how trauma is like. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the state of believers in this ayah that they were so scared that it was as if their hearts reached their throats. SubhanAllah, it was a huge test. But what happened when they were tested and they remained firm and they trusted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent wind against the opponent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed the tents and the animals of the non-believers with just one of his soldiers. What was it? The wind. There was a huge windstorm that destroyed everything. So the mushrikeen had to leave. And Alhamdulillah, the Muslims were saved. I number 12 till 20, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us that because the battle of trench, the battle of Ahzab demanded sacrifice of sleep and rest, deprivation of food and water, what happened was that the hypocrites who were living in Medina, they came up with all kinds of excuses in order to be exempted from duty. So because the Prophet ﷺ gave a task to every person, all the Muslims, all the residents of Medina, that every person has to guard the trench so that no one is able to attack from its side, the Munafiqeen, because they just pretended to be Muslims, they had no interest in defending the Muslims, they came up with all the excuses so that they are exempted from duty. They said Allah and His Messenger hasn't promised anything but illusion. Let's head back. Who's going to fight with such a massive army? We're going to support. We're not going to support you. We're not going to defend you. We're going to go back. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposes their hypocrisy that was hidden in their hearts by saying, the hypocrites fear death. However, death is something which is certain. They cannot escape it. And this is the fact of the matter. This is reality that death is certain. So we shouldn't fear death because when it is supposed to come, it will come to us. What we can do is prepare for it. I number 21 till 27, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposes treachery to the Muslims. So again, what happened was it was extremely cold and the food supplies were dwindling. The Muslims were constantly guarding the trench against the outside enemies. However, to make matters worse, this tribe of Banu Quraida, who were basically the Jews who had signed a peace treaty with the Prophet, they broke their treaty and they planned to attack the Muslims from within the vicinity of Medina. So this was a very testing moment for the believers because they feared opposition from inside and outside. And subhanAllah, that is the current state of Gaza. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help the Muslims. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala liberate the oppressed Muslims over there and grant them victory. 
So when the Muslims feared, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed that you have an excellent example in the Prophet. So trust Allah, just like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam trusted Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed his Prophet regarding the deception of Banu Quraida. That this is what they're planning behind your back, so hold them accountable for it. So that's when they were penalized for their treachery. Why? Because they were in a peace treaty. And if someone tries to break away from a peace treaty and try to harm their own alliances, then they have to suffer consequences for it. This is also country law, any country's law. When you violate the laws of country, then there are consequences for that. There are repercussions for that. So even though the Muslims were tested through Banu Quraida, yet the Muslims were victorious in the end. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us that yes, sometimes things become challenging. Life throws trials and tribulations towards us. But the greater the test, the bigger the reward. So let us not resent the difficulties. Let's celebrate the victories, inshallah. Moving on to the next passage, this surah was revealed in the fifth year after Hijrah. So, of course, by this time, the economic circumstances of Muslims were changing. The Muslim population was growing in terms of its wealth. So now the Prophet wasallam had much more access to wealth compared to what he used to have in Mecca. So what happened was that some of our mothers, the names that I shared before, some of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ came to the Prophet ﷺ asking for a better lifestyle. And they have every right to do so. Because remember, the house of the Prophet ﷺ was such that the stove wasn't lit for months. For months, they would survive on water and dates. So it's definitely not a sin for our mothers to convey their request to the Prophet ﷺ to have a better lifestyle. However, the Prophet ﷺ was sent as a role model for the entire humanity. So it wasn't befitting him to live in a mansion while there are so many people suffering due to poverty. So he couldn't accept this request from his wives. So the Prophet wasallam he felt tense. He felt overwhelmed, not sure what to reply to his wives. So he basically withdrew himself from his wives for an entire month and slept in the masjid. Again, another lesson for the husbands is that in Islam, if there is a marital tension going on, Never ever is the wife kicked out of her home. Never. It's the husband who sleeps in a different room. It's the husband who can choose to go sleep in a masjid until the issue is resolved. So this is the ayah where the Prophet ﷺ told his wives that if you want the glamour of this trivial world, this trivial dunya, then you can have it. I can simply give you money and let you go with ihsan, meaning I can divorce you and you can live in peace however you wish. You can go your way and I can go my way. But if you wish to receive the amenities of Jannah, the rewards and mansions of Jannah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you for your patience, for your sabr. So the choice is given, the choice was given to them. And subhanAllah, look at the strength of their iman. Not even one of them chose dunya over akhirah. Not even one of them chose divorce over marriage. SubhanAllah. Everyone preferred the companionship of the Prophet. Each wife was given full rights to make her own decision, but they all chose to be the wife of Rasulullah in this world. And Jannah, subhanAllah. So in the next passage, some of the social laws are highlighted for us. 
meaning specific commands directed towards the wives of the Prophet wasallam. But in turn, this is a manual for all of us to live by. What is it? That when we deal with opposite gender, we shouldn't speak too softly. We shouldn't speak in a flirtatious manner, nor we should beautify ourselves in a way that may entice evil thoughts in their hearts. So obligations are highlighted over here that we should fulfill our spiritual duties in a manner that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained upon us. We cannot find loopholes in it. We cannot make hijab, uh, you know, optional for us. This is something which is mandated upon us. So we have to abide by these rulings. Next is ayah number 35. And this is a beautiful ayah because it presents to us gender equality in Islam. Once the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, by the name of Umm Salama radiyallahu anha, asked, "Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, how come only men are mentioned in the Quran, whereas we, the woman, also went through trials? We also went through tribulations when we accepted Islam. We also endured the hardships of Hijra. So why are only men mentioned in the Quran?" And subhanAllah, in response to her question, these ayat were revealed. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Surely men and women who submit, men and women who are obedient, men and women who are truthful, men and women who are steadfast, men and women who are humble, men and women who give sadaqah, men and women who fast, men and women who guard their chastity, and men and women who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala much, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared for them forgiveness and a great reward. So let's go through this checklist and inshallah try to incorporate these qualities in us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to be efficient enough to be from this good Muslim checklist inshallah. Next, we move on to our passage from ayah 36 till 38. And there is a specific context behind these ayat. So I would want all of us to zoom into the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and zoom into the scene specifically when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got married to Zainab bint Jahash. So what happened? The Prophet ﷺ had initially arranged the marriage of his um, freed slave, Zayd radiallahu an, with his cousin, Zainab radiallahu anha. So this was something the Prophet ﷺ did. SubhanAllah, he um, tried to, um, SubhanAllah, propose to Zainab on behalf of Zayd. So he is the one who arranged their marriage. However, Zainab came from an elite background. She came from a rich, affluent um, family. Whereas Zayd, radiallahu an, we all know Zayd bin Harissa was a freed slave of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he wasn't rich. He didn't come from an elite background. Zainab was an Arab, whereas Zayd was a black person. So this marriage wasn't really going on well. However, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam performed the duty of matchmaking because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam loved them a lot. So he wanted both of them to be together. And why did he choose to do this kind of matchmaking? Because his intention was to eliminate the class system that existed in pre-Islamic Arabia. The differences between rich and poor, black and white, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted to eliminate all this. So what happened? The marriage took place. However, Zainab radiallahu an and Zayd radiallahu an were not compatible with each other at all. And it's natural. When two people from completely different backgrounds try to live with each other, it's difficult to adjust. 
So Zayd radiallahu an kept coming to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, complaining him about Zainab and asking him if it's permissible for him to divorce her. And Zainab radiallahu an kept telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam how she doesn't feel inclined towards Zayd, how she feels she's not compatible for Zayd. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala references that in these ayat that the Prophet ﷺ kept telling Zayd to be patient with his wife. He kept telling Zayd, hold on to her, be patient. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards the muttaqin. But little did the Prophet know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a different plan. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the Quran that Zayd should divorce Zainab and the Prophet ﷺ should get married to her. Now, this was a very heavy command, even for the Prophet ﷺ, because to break away from the shackles of cultural norm is something very difficult. It's not easy because everyone goes against you. Everyone talks behind you. And back then, 1400 years ago, the Arabs used to consider their adopted sons as their real sons. So this command, this hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was given to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to break all cultural norms regarding the banni. What is the banni? To establish the fact that an adopted child is actually your, old chi your own child. So Islam came to abolish that rule that an adopted child is not like your biological child. Which means that if Zayd divorces Zainab, marriage with the ex of Zayd, marriage with the divorcee of Zayd radiallahu an is permissible for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this marriage had wisdom behind it and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam got married to zainab not because he initiated this marriage this marriage was arranged above the seven heavens subhanallah so this was an honor for zainab radiyallahu anha because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was the one who arranged her marriage i number 40 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Muhammad is not the father of any of your men, but he is the messenger of Allah and Khatimun Nabiyyin, seal of the prophets. And Allah is cognizant of everything. Meaning, if a sect amongst the Muslims claims that they have a prophet amongst them, then this is going to be an allegation blasphemy because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clearly stated that there will be no other prophet after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? Because he is the seal of prophethood. Now what if someone says, how about Isa alayhi salam? He's going to descend near the day of judgment. Isn't he the last prophet? The answer is no. Because Isa alayhi salam, according to chronological order, he already came before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So when he comes in his second descent near the day of judgment, he will come as a follower of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Meaning he will teach people the Quran and he will live according to the guidelines of Quran. So he will not come as a new prophet, but as a follower of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Moving on to ayah number 53. Now a snapshot is given to us after the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got married to Zainab radiallahu anha. When the ceremony was over, meaning when the walima was over, few people kept sitting in the house of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for a very long time. Just talking to each other, chatting with each other. So this was a source of discomfort for the Prophet ﷺ. But he felt too shy to ask his guests to leave. And that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the following ayat. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, O you who believe, do not enter the house of the Prophet unless permission is given to you for a meal. 
And then not so early as to wait for its preparation. But when you're invited, enter. And when you have taken your meal, disperse without sitting for a talk. Verily, such behavior upsets the Prophet. And he is shy of asking you to go. But Allah is not embarrassed to tell you the truth. So this ayah was revealed on the occasion of Zainab radiallahu anha's marriage with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And it teaches us, etiquettes of visitation, that any time we visit someone who is sick or the purpose of our visit is to give congratulations for a celebration or give condolences to someone, the sunnah is to stay there for a specified amount of time and then leave. Staying at the house of the host for a prolonged amount of time such that they feel burdened and overwhelmed isn't Islamic etiquette. However, if the host asks you to stay, then it's a different story. Or if you are staying with the intention to help the host clean up after the gathering, of course, that's a different intention. Moving on to the next passage on number 56, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah and his angels give blessings to the Prophet. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, call for blessings on him and greet him with the prayer of peace. So importance of sending durud on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has been highlighted over here. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to us on the day of judgment, the person closest to me will be the one who has sent the most durud upon me. So subhanAllah, if we wish to be in close proximity to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day of qiyamah, in Jannah, what should we do? We should moisten our tongues with durud. So it shouldn't be just something that we do on the day of Jum'ah. Ah. It shouldn't be something that we just recite in our salah. It should be an ongoing habit. Because it is a source of elevation and a source of forgiveness of sins. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Ayah number 59. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us over here the Islamic dress code for women. And in terms of surahs, we see that surah Nur and surah Ahzab are considered twin surahs. Because both these surahs consist of social and moral laws. In surah Nur, we learned that Muslim women should cover their hair with a piece of cloth such that it covers the chest. So ruling regarding hijab was revealed over there. And over here in this surah, we learn that women are guided to wear an extra long and loose clothing over their regular home clothes in order to maintain their chastity. And subhanAllah, it doesn't have to be an abaya. It can be a long, loose cardigan. It could be a long piece of cloth that we cover over around us in order to... Um, SubhanAllah, you know, uh, wrap ourselves in a way that our body is is not, uh, you know, showing the shape. The, sh the shape of the body is not obvious. And SubhanAllah, this is something which is mandated upon the woman. So this is something very important to know because many a times people ask, where is hijab mentioned in the Quran? What is the obligation of wearing an abaya or wearing a loose clothing on top of the clothes that we're wearing? This is the ayah for it. This is the reference for it. And many a times people think that Islam is the one who has introduced all these suppressing, you know, legalities for women in order to suppress women. And it's not fair. SubhanAllah, Islam did not introduce this because if we look back at the pictures of the Christian nuns or anyone, even from the past century, 20th century, 19th century, if we look at the pictures of women, subhanAllah, their attire is exactly to the attire which is mentioned in the Quran, which is supposed to be an Islamic attire for women. And basically, in the olden days, the more layers of clothes the woman wore, it signaled more nobility for her. So subhanAllah, it's our choice 
how do we wish us to be? What rank do we wish to be in? How much qurb, nearness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we want to be, to have. I number 72 and 73, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we offered the trust to the heavens and the earth and the mountains, but they refuse to bear it. So what is this trust? It's mentioned that the heavens and the earth, the mountains were asked if they can adhere to the commands of Allah. They will be gifted with an eternal life in Jannah. So what happened? All of them refused, but insan, human beings, accepted. SubhanAllah. So this was a promise taken from us long time ago. And no doubt it's a great responsibility, but let's not forget the reward that follows after. Because many times we think to ourselves, I wish I wasn't even born. I wish I was just a tree. I wish I had no life for me. SubhanAllah. And Sometimes we utter these statements because of the problems and trials that are going on in our lives. But subhanAllah, let's not forget the reward that will be preserved for us if we're patient. Because with sabr, with patience, with tawakkul is immense reward in the hereafter. So this is basically a mind map of Surah Ahzab that I created for you. Inshallah, we can go over it and see the rulings that are laid out. For us. So moving on to the next surah, Surah Saba. Surah Saba is a Makki surah, and subhanAllah, the surah takes its name from verse number 15, in which the word Saba is mentioned. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off this surah by saying, Alhamdulillahi ladhi lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard, wa lahu alhamdu fi al-akhirah, wa huwa al-hakim al-khabir. Praise be to Allah, to whom belongs everything in the heavens and the earth, and praise be to him in the hereafter. He is the wise and he is the expert. Next, we move on to the next passage, ayah number 10 and 11, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us about Da'ud alayhi salam and his legacy. So who is Da'ud alayhi salam? Basically, Da'ud alayhi salam um, is the descendant from Judah, one of the 12 sons of Prophet Yaqub alayhi salam. He is the descendant of Judah. And Da'ud alayhi salam came after Musa alayhi salam in order to keep his teachings alive. In terms of his youth years, subhanAllah, we come to know that he became the successor of Talut. And in terms of prophethood, we come to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him knowledge, wisdom, plus zabur. So he not only came as a prophet, but he came as a messenger because he was given a scripture. Also, we come to know that he was blessed with a beautiful voice. Anytime he would engage in the worship of Allah, the birds rushed towards him. And the birds and the mountains joined him in divine worship in their own language. And this teaches us the importance of zikr, that as believers, we should always keep our tongues moistened with zikr. So, subhanAllah, when we talk about Da'ud alayhi salam, let's talk about little history in order to have a full grasp of who Da'ud alayhi salam is. So basically, we discussed about the story of Musa alayhi salam in Surah Qasas. After Musa alayhi salam passed away and Yusha bin Nun be became the successor of Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he led the Israelites into the promised land of Palestine. That's when, subhanAllah, the Israelites had a box with them. After Musa alayhi salam passed away, they had a box with them, which is known as the Ark of Covenant. And this box basically consisted of some of the remnants of Musa alayhi salam's belongings, such as his staff and the staff of Harun alayhi salam, the tablets on which the Ten Commandments were given to the Israelites. All those precious items were preserved in this box. And it's known as the Ark of Covenant. So this Ark of Covenant was very special for the Israelites. Why? Because it gave them hope and reassurance that every time they go into a battle with these blessed items, then that's when they come, they become victorious. They won the battle. 
However, when a lot of subhanAllah corruption started to take place amongst the Israelites, they started to engage in excessive battles externally and internally. So after some time, the Ark was lost. The covenant of Ark was lost. Now we can understand the excessive battles that happened from externally that an opponent army would come and fight with them. But what were the internal battles? Internal battles meaning when they were already victorious and they entered Palestine with Yusha ben Nun and they're living happily ever after, what's the need to fight internally amongst each other? And it's mentioned that there were 12 tribes of the children of Israel and they would fight amongst each other. So the progeny of the 10 sons of Yaqub salam from one mother would belittle the progeny of Yusuf alayhi salam and Binyamin because they were from another mother. Subhanallah. So we can see the effect of jealousy carried out for generations and caused animosity between them. So due to these excessive internal battles, the Ark of Covenant was lost. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appointed Talut to be their king, whom they rejected again because Talut was from the progeny of Binyamin. That's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returned the Ark of Covenant to them, back to the Israelites, on condition that they would accept Talut as their king. So they accepted, and under his leadership, they faced Goliath, and his army, and no one was able to face the tyrants of that city. No one was able to fight with Goliath because he was mighty and strong, except for a young boy. And who is he? Da'ud alayhi salam. He basically used his slingshot to kill Goliath. And this resulted in a great victory for the Israelites. And subhanAllah, Da'ud alayhi salam became the successor of King Talut and attained kingdom from him. He got married to his daughter, and subhanAllah, he was the one under whose leadership all the tribes of the Israelites became united. So subhanAllah, since there were these battles, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave a miracle to Dawood alayhi salam, which was that he was able to mold steel in any way, shape, or form as he wished in order to make armors for battle. So subhanAllah, he was a very powerful warrior. He was the richest person of his time. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights to us that he would sit with people and resolve their matters. And that's why people adored him. People loved him as their leader. So we come to know that once Da'ud salam was sitting in his mihrab, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when all of a sudden he saw two people coming in and they came to receive judgment over a case. They wanted Da'ud salam to judge for them. So Da'ud salam heard one person's story and passed a judgment in his favor. Without even listening to the other person, he passed the judgment. That's when the two people disappeared. And subhanAllah, Da'ud realized that he has been tested by Allah because these were not two men, they were angels who came down to test him. And this teaches us that with kingdom, with glory, with higher rank comes responsibility. So this was a test, this was a trial, and as soon as Da'ud realized that he messed up, he immediately fell down in prostration and asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a tawbah. And he was forgiven. And subhanAllah, it's mentioned that Da'ud salam, the highlight of his life was that he would divide his day into four parts. So one part to earn a living and to rest, one to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do his worship, another one to listen to the complaints of his people, and the last part to deliver khutbas, to deliver sermons. So Dawood alayhi salam, despite being the richest person of his time, despite owning a massive empire, he was a very humble servant. He used to worship Allah a lot. And 
we come to know from the prophetic hadith that the fasting and prayer of Dawood alayhi salam is applauded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he would fast on alternate days. And then he would divide his sleep in a way that he would sleep, get up and pray for some time, and then go to sleep. So even, subhanAllah, his days and nights SubhanAllah shined with worship because in day he was fasting and at night he was praying Qiyamul Layl. And SubhanAllah, when a person lived such a humble lifestyle, then he's definitely honored. So we come to know that when he died, SubhanAllah, tens of thousands of people attended his janazah to the point that even the birds attended his janazah. And of course, that's understandable because when he recited the Zabur, the birds in the mountains would recite along with him. So the birds attended his janazah and it's mentioned that because the day when Dawud passed away, it was an intensely hot day. Sulaiman who was the son of Dawud asked the birds to gather together, gather around and shade the people shade the attendees who came to attend the funeral of Dawood alayhi salam. Subhanallah. So it was a very beautiful funeral, a beautiful ending. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a blessed ending and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable people to witness for us. Ameen. So when Dawood alayhi salam passed away, Sulaiman alayhi salam inherited him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa waritha Dawoodu Sulaiman. Sulaiman inherited Daud. And we come to know that Sulaiman alayhi salam was given more wisdom than Daud alayhi salam. We come to know that Sulaiman alayhi salam was given more power than Daud alayhi salam. So it's mentioned that once two women came to Daud alayhi salam for judgment. The matter of concern was that a wolf came and took away one of the babies. So both these women had babies and a wolf came and took away one of the babies. And both of them claimed that the baby who's left is her baby. So they came to seek judgment with Dawood salam, who judged that the boy should be given to the older lady because the younger woman can have more children in future. So that was his judgment. However, young Suleiman who was observing his father, who was observing the entire scene, he said, give me a knife so that I may cut the child into two pieces and then give each one of you half of his body. As soon as he said that, the younger lady shouted, oh my God, do not do that. He is a baby. He's a child. Give it to her. I don't want him. And subhanAllah, looking at the desperation of this woman, Sulaiman alayhi salam immediately realized that the child belongs to the younger lady because she cannot see her child being cut into half. So this was the wisdom that was given to Sulaiman alayhi salam more than his father Da'ud alayhi salam. What else was given to him? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in these ayat that he was given the control over winds such that an entire month's journey was covered in an afternoon. Plus the fact that the human birds and jinns were subjugated for him. SubhanAllah. So moving on to the next passage, on number 15 till 19, this surah, SubhanAllah, is named after the people of Saba. So what is the history of the people of Saba? Let's try to cover that quickly. These were basically the descendants of the queen of Saba. If you remember back when we were doing the story of Suleiman alayhi salam, we spoke about the fact that the queen of Saba, who used to worship the sun, was given an invitation by Suleiman alayhi salam, an invitation of Islam. She accepted Islam and subhanAllah, she became a Muslim. However, what happened after many years of her and her progeny being upon Islam, being upon Tawheed, corruptions started to creep in to that generation. And that's when the nation of Saba abandoned Islam and became idol worshippers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes to us that they had two marvelous gardens. 
one to the right and one to the left. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them to eat from whatever he has provided them and to be grateful. However, what happened? Generally, when we're given too many blessings, we start taking our blessings for granted, right? So they started taking their blessings for granted. And they supplicated to Allah to make the stages between their journeys longer and difficult. They wanted some challenge in life. They were too tired of going easy with their lifestyle. So they literally made dua to Allah to make stages between their journeys longer and difficult. To make the good turn it into bad. Just like the children of Israel who asked man and salwa to be replaced with herbs, cucumbers, and lentils. So what happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished them for their ingratitude by causing their dam to break, flooding them completely because of their lack of gratitude. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaced their two beautiful gardens with bitter fruit and sparse thorny trees. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us because as women, we are very ungrateful at times. Subhanallah. We complain a lot. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the opportunity that we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be grateful for his blessings. Ameen. Ayah number 31 till 33. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us that the nation of Saba were destroyed due to their sins. And if we die without making tawbah, we will face consequences for our sins in the hereafter as well. So we have to be very cautious of victim mentality because many a times, subhanAllah, when we commit crime, we blame Qadr, we blame Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and act innocent. We become, subhanAllah, you know, we have self-pity on ourselves and we act as if there's nothing that we did wrong. We are innocent. We are naive. And all the fault is because shaitan misled me. All the fault is because my friend peer pressurized me. All the fault is because of my parents. They never nurtured me with the teachings of Quran. All the fault is of my teacher who never guided me what's right and wrong. So we easily play victim. And we have to be aware of victim mentality because each one of us will be held accountable for the choices we make. Yes, there are whispers from shaitan. Yes, there are recommendations made by friends, people, peers around us. But the final action has to be taken by us. The final step has to be made by us. And once we take those steps, we are accountable for them. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us and guide us with the teachings of Islam so that we can become better Muslims. So ayah number 4241, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, On the day when he gathers them all together, then say to the angels, Was it you that they used to worship? And they will say, be you glorified. You are our master, not them. In fact, they used to worship the jinn, and most of them had faith in them. Meaning, subhanAllah, the, the people of Makkah, because again, this is a Makki surah, so ayat are revealed in that context. The people of Makkah used to believe that the angels are the daughters of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will interrogate the angels on the day of Qiyamah that did you ask them to worship you? And while the people are watching, while the people are hoping that the angels are going to help them out against Allah, the angels are going to say bluntly, Ya Allah, we never asked them to worship us. It's them who made this decision. And that's when they will realize that the idols that they worshipped, the jinns that they worshipped, 
are not going to help them, are not going to avail them, and they will be left all alone, and they will be punished for their falsehood. So I number 49 to 54, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us that falsehood can neither originate nor return because the truth will triumph. And that is the reality of life. That no matter how many people we deceive, no matter how many lies do we utter, at the end, haq does come out. The truth does prevail. And it will definitely triumph near the day of judgment. So even though we're living like a very hopeless Muslim ummah, where we see oppression all around us, where we do not see a ray of hope anywhere, we have to have this firm belief and solid conviction in our heart that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will definitely help us. So that brings us to the conclusion of Surah Saba. And the main highlight of Surah Saba is that we should be grateful for the blessings that we have, just like the grateful Abd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Da'ud and Sulaiman alayhi salam. And that brings us to Surah Fatir. Surah Fatir is again, uh, not very long surah, so inshallah, let's try to cover it as soon as possible. Ayah 1, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off the surah with Alhamdulillahi fatir samawati wal ard, ja'ilil malaikati rusulan uli ajnihati mathna wa thulata wa ruba'a. Yazidu fil khalqi ma yasha' inna allaha ala kulli shay'in khalib. Praise be to Allah, fatir, originator of the heavens and the earth, maker of the angels, messengers who are with wings double, triple, and quadruple. He adds to creation as he wills. Allah is able to do all things. And subhanAllah, Surah Fatir is also a Makki Surah. So the word Fatir is from the first verse. Um, and that's what the Surah is after. And the other name for the Surah is Surah Al-Malaika. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about the Malaika that amongst the angels, there are some who have a wing, two wings, triple wings, or four wings, many wings. So one of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are angels. And this is part of our iman, pillar of our iman, that we believe in their existence. So who are angels? Angels are basically infallible creatures made of light who are entrusted with different tasks. Angels belong to a level of existence beyond the perceptible world of phenomena. What is this called? Ilmul Ghaib. The world of unseen. So believing in the angels is an essential part of our iman. And this ayah gives us a description of angels that they are creatures with wings. So subhanAllah, something that we only see in animation, they are in fact real. And subhanAllah, they fly. They are given, subhanAllah, um, characteristics that we are not given, special powers that we humans are not given. And subhanAllah, they are the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who worship him 24-7 and never disobey him. And they carry out his commands. So ayah 15 to 17, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us that whatever we do, we do it for our own selves. So if we do good, we benefit ourselves. If we do bad, we harm ourselves. And many a time, subhanAllah, when we're asked to pray salah or fast in the month of Ramadan or give charity, at times we question, why should I feed the poor? Allah can take care of his slaves. Why should I worship Allah when the angels are worshiping Allah all the time? So subhanAllah, in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that, oh people, if you, it's you who are in need of Allah. Allah is not in need of your worship. So again, the motto of life should be in ahsantum li anfusikum. Whatever good we do, we do it for our own selves. I number 28 till 30. Teaches us about the true scholars. Who are the ulama? So we learn over here, subhanAllah, after we learn about the people of Saba who were enriched with all sorts of resources and a massive dam, but due to their ungrateful attitude, they were inflicted with distress and calamity. And then on the contrary, 
an example was given to us of Dawood and Suleiman that taught us that despite the splendors of the world and possessing a great kingdom, they were amongst the most grateful of people. Why? Due to their khashya, due to their fear of Allah. And the question is, who are the true ulama? Who are the true scholars? The people who fear Allah the most. And this fear, khashya, is not the kind of fear that, oh my God, I need to do this because Allah will punish me. This is a type of fear where we doesn't want to, we do not want to disappoint Allah. We want to make him happy. We want to please him. So this is the kind of khashya that we need to incorporate. And when we talk about khashya, khashya is attained with knowledge. True knowledge is not superficial knowledge. True knowledge is one that is attained with sincerity of heart. With the intention to please Allah and not people. And subhanAllah, in this term, in this regard, we have various examples in our history of seekers of knowledge. For instance, when we look at the son of Prophet Muhammad wasallam's uncle, Al-Abbas, the one who is famously known as Abdullah ibn Abbas, he spent only three years with the Prophet wasallam studying under him. And he was only 13 years old when the Prophet wasallam passed away. Yet, he became one of the top scholars, ulama, narrators of hadith of Islam. How? It's mentioned that, subhanAllah, that he took majority of the hadith from some of the older sahaba who passed away earlier. So he would be so earnest to seek knowledge from the companions of the Prophet ﷺ that if he heard any companion reporting a hadith, he would go to visit him. If the person was taking the midday nap, he would lay down his garment and sit outside their house waiting for him, even though the wind would be blowing dust on his face. And that sahabi, the person would come out for dhuhr salah and he would be surprised to see Ibn Abbas sitting right outside his house and he would claim, oh nephew of Prophet, you should have called me and I would come to you. And he would say, no, it's my need to seek knowledge from you, so I should come to you. And this is, subhanAllah, an advice for all students of knowledge, which Ibn Abbas radiallahu an said, that I showed humility as a student, so I was given respect as a teacher. And subhanAllah, that's how it is. Khatib al-Baghdadi, he said, the best time to memorize is in the early morning then the midday, then the early evening. And subhanAllah, scholars say that whoever wishes to memorize a surah of the Quran or a hadith, memorization should be done in morning in order to review because that is the best time. So inshallah, the more effort we put into this, inshallah, the more khashya we can get by seeking knowledge. And as we apply this knowledge in our lives, the more fruits we'll be able to see in our lives. I number 45, again, brings to us a powerful conclusion of this surah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if Allah was to immediately hold us accountable for our sins, not a creature would remain on the earth because we will perish but it's only the mercy of Allah that he gives us respite. He gives us time to repent. He gives us time to seek tawbah. He gives us time to correct. But if we still persist on sinful activity, then that's when the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends upon people. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us, not to take our blessings for granted, thank Allah, and work according to his pleasure. So with the conclusion of Surat Fatir, I have just like created this chart for all of us to see the different angels that are out there that are part of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the different tasks that are given to them and they carry them out with the idhan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to safeguard us, in order to nurture us, in order to take care of us.
And by the way, the list is not just limited to these. There are much more angels than these. SubhanAllah, more than we can even fathom. And if you want to know more info on this, there's a great book by Umar al-Ashqar, which is known as The World of Angels. Inshallah, I can share the link with you on the group so that you can um, read the PDF of it. So with that said, we will conclude our session for today. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashhadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka, 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 wa natubu ilayk. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al-nar. Allahumma anis wahshati fi qabri. Allahumma arhamni bil Qur'an al-Azim. وجعله لي إماما ونورا وهدى ورحمة اللهم ذكرني منهما نسيت وعلمني منهما جهلت ورزقني تلاوته أنا الليل وأنا النهار وجعله لي حجة يا رب العالمين أمين صم أمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته جزاكم الله خيرا كثيرا